Hello and welcome to the Paley Fest Fall TV Previews. I'm Stacey Wilson-Hunt and I'm so happy to be your host for this special conversation about Showtime's exciting new drama, Let the Right One In. Thank you to City, our official card and sponsor for their help in making this program possible. Today we are so thrilled to welcome members of the series' gifted cast and creative team. Joining us are showrunner and executive producer Andrew Hinderocker, executive producer and director Seath Mann, Madison Taylor Baez, who plays Eleanor, Anika Noni Rose, who plays Naomi, and Demian Bashir, who plays Mark and is also a producer. Welcome to everybody. It's so nice to see you. First of all, how are you? The big question that we can never not ask. <laughs> How's everybody holding up? Happy, healthy? Good. good. <laughs> everybody happy and healthy, yes. Good, Amen. good, good. Well, you all look great and we're so honored to have you here today. I know it's no small feat getting everyone together. So my first question is for Andrew. I know he didn't want to be first, but we're forcing him to be first. So <laughs> <laughs> you are the brain trust. So this is, this is, we're looking to you for your guidance. So I've been actually a fan of this IP and source material forever. Um, I saw the original film in 08, the Swedish film, of course, based on the 2004 Swedish novel, incredible source material, incredible story. You know, it's no small thing to make a show, but also to reinterpret beloved IP is also very difficult. So I wanted to know you as a creator and a storyteller, what resonated with you so intensely about this original source material that made you want to reimagine it for Showtime in this context? Yeah, and thank you so much for having us all here. We're thrilled to talk about the project. Uh, like you, I adored the novel and the film. I, there are so many aspects of it that I find extraordinary, but um, perhaps most of all, how seriously it takes the condition of being a vampire, mm. what it would actually mean to never feel the sun on your skin, to never eat any food but blood, to have to take a life to stay alive uh, and to even have to enlist others and potentially compromise their humanity in order to survive. And I think that, you know, it did it at a time when so many films and shows were uh, exploiting what's so cool about being a vampire. You know, you sort of throw on your sunglasses and then you're out in the sun and everything is great. <laughs> and um, in essence, for me, by, by taking seriously all that is brutal about being a monster and honoring the darkness of the source material and the genre, it makes space for the light to shine so much brighter. And mm -hmm. I think in the film and in the novel, the, the, the relationship between, the, between this bully boy Oscar and, and this creature, Ali, these, these uh, lonely isolated creatures is just exquisite and it's so moving and, and their love and compassion shines through. And so for me, as somebody who loves this genre, I started my career with uh, a show called Penny Dreadful. So yes, the idea- Also on of, Showtime, yes. <laughs> also on Showtime. And so the idea of getting to traffic in both darkness and light mm. and um, to, to honor all that is, is terrifying about the story, but all that is emotional and moving, about it was uh, an opportunity I really couldn't pass up. And then in terms of translating the source material to television, I felt like there was a tremendous opportunity to honor everything that's so beautiful and that I loved so much about the film and the novel, but also there was a, uh, a great freedom to invent new characters, new storylines. And in particular in the, in the novel and the film, there's a, a, what's really a secondary relationship between this, child vampire creature and her caretaker or his caretaker, their caretaker. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and in our series, uh, that's been translated to, to different characters. Uh, our, uh, our creature, Eleanor, played mm -hmm. ferociously by Madison Taylor Bias <laughs> and her father played by Demian. Mm -hmm. and, and in um, getting to sort of shift the lens to uh, a father who is uh, sacrificing and risking all to take care of an afflicted child. It felt like for me, it was an opportunity to make the material very personal to me, but um, to also open up the storytelling and open up to characters like Naomi that Anika plays so beautifully, who's a parent and a professional and a hunter and, and ferocious herself. And so it, it really felt like this incredible opportunity to honor the source material and to write something that was really a love letter to that to that novel and that film, but that was a story entirely its own. Hmm. 
And, and what I love also is there's a grounding in reality in this iteration. This is a setting that we know, it's New York City. We know these streets, we know these buildings. These could be people we all know in real life as opposed to other more fantastical you know, versions of vampire stories. They may not resonate as personally. And I, and I love that. I feel like I could know these people in real life. So I think that's really cool. So well oh, done on that front. <laughs> I appreciate that. And Damien, it's so nice to see you again. I can't believe it's been 10 years since I first met you, A Better Life, your Oscar nominated role. And what's amazing is here we are 10 years later and you're playing a father once again, who will risk anything to give his child life, to protect her, to feed her, to clothe her. And that's so interesting to me that there's this arc in your work that is, first of all, you never shy away from a struggle. You never shy away from playing characters who are facing immense grief and danger. So I would love to know, what was your first reaction when you read the script? Like your gut emotional reaction? Uh, well, it's, it's great seeing you again. <laughs> you too. Um, and it's been quite a, quite, a, quite a journey over the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, nothing has really changed ever since I remember what I wanted as an actor. Um, and it's, you know, if you think about it, it's really very, uh, very simple. Uh, I'm just looking for solid material, uh, some really powerful, well-written drama. And, uh, and if I'm lucky to find a member memorable uh, character, then, you know, I'll be, I'll be there. Um, that's, that's what I found here in this pilot, because even though this is based on a beautiful film that I personally love very much and I, I appreciate very much, uh, this is to me a different journey and that's, that's how I have to see it. Um, and to me, everything starts right there on the paper. And uh, what Andrew wrote was was exactly that, you know, what I what I'm always looking for. I thought it was going to be a powerful, powerful statement, not only in terms of the genre, but also when you take a dive into so many analogies where, you know, with the world we live in right now, mm. especially with, you know, people like myself, you know, who are immigrants, who are different, who speak differently, who look differently, or, you know, that's, that's pretty much how one of the main issues in humanity right now. Uh, we're the same uh, beings, and, uh, but yet it seems like we're like from different planets sometimes. <laughs> and uh, so everything was right there. And, uh, and the next step was, of course, you know, who's going to make the, this beautiful thing? You know, who's going to make this happen and possible? And, uh, and of course, you know, when I remember we, we had a long meeting with uh, Seath and, and Andrew, and that was it. You know, these this two dear brothers of mine caught me right away, and, uh, and, and I, was, I was in, I was trapped. And, of course, you know, who are you going to play? You know, who are you going to jump into the tennis court with? Because uh, my game is only as good as you know my <laughs> opponent, and my, and in this case, my my co-stars and uh, my my team players, you know. So having Anika and Madison, and of course mm -hmm. Grace and Kevin, and uh, the whole cast was was just you know Ian, please Ian. Uh, mm -hmm. So beautiful, and uh, it, it, so that when you have all that right there on your plate you know it's gonna be a beautiful journey. And, and that's exactly what, what it wants. Hmm. Sounds like a match made in heaven or hell, depending on how we look at the story, right? <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> that's I'm, true. I'm, I'm curious, Damien, when you have meetings with creatives like Seath and Andrew, what are you looking for from them that makes you kind of fall in love? Is it something that they say about their vision? Is there something that they say about how they work with actors? Because I know you take a lot of meetings and they don't all go well, right? <laughs> so what was it about the way these gentlemen outlined their vision that made you choose? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is all that, you know, all of that. Uh, very few directors and producers and writers know that when we audition, we also audition them, you know? Exactly, they that's also, right. <laughs> they also audition to us. And because uh, right. that's how we measure 
how they, you know, even the music they listen to or, you know, the films they love or right. the things they hate and love about life and, the, you know, art in general and the, and how we, this, you see, we have this in common. All these group of uh, beautiful artists, we see this as an art form mm. and we see this uh, something beyond show business. We, we see here a beautiful place to do what we love, you know, and be creative and be collaboradores, collaboradores, collaborative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, <laughs> and because uh, to me, that's that's pretty much what this is about. You know, it's a collaboration type of work. And uh, and you have to set up the environment and the, uh, the, the ground and the mood from the, you know, uh, all the way from the top down. And uh, so Andrew and C, have uh, made that possible, but you can only do that in the perfect, you know, network or production company. In this case, Showtime, which is my second time working with. Yes, with them. Leeds, and, of um, course, being your it first. It couldn't be yeah. better. <laughs> yeah, it couldn't have been better. You know, it couldn't have been more. You know, couldn't have been happier. It's been it's been a wonderful journey. I'm so happy to hear that. I'm always rooting for you. So I'm glad that you landed with some good folks. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you. Madison, I was telling her earlier that I'm so starstruck because I've seen her sing in the YouTube video. And I have to say, I'm just blown away. So I can't wait to see what you do on that front later on. But for now, playing a young vampirist, is that the feminine version that we're using? Uh, I have to think this must have not been an easy shoot for you. You're a California girl shooting in New York in the winter at night. So tell me what was the most difficult part of that process for you and how did you stay warm? I, I just have to know this. You know, I think one of the most difficult things about that was really just acting like you're not cold because obviously <laughs> vampires don't get cold. So that's right. There's nights right. where we were shooting in like, heck, like 45 degree weather cold midnight and the wind blowing against us makes it even colder and I just couldn't get cold so I think that's one of the hardest parts just really more so the acting part just acting like you're not freezing <laughs> well you but, did a great um, job I couldn't tell that you were cold at all thank you <laughs> And I have to know, you know, that what I do like about the show is that you don't overdo the prosthetics and the special effects. And that again, comes back to that groundedness feeling. I do love that the eye effects are very cool. And also there is some blood, inevitably it's a vampire story. I have to know what is the blood made of that you are obviously having to taste a little bit of during this process? Yeah, the blood is made of, it's a mixture of crystal light, um, but it's definitely the high sugar ratio. I mean. <laughs> It, it's a lot of sugar, but I want to say the first time I drank it, I was just taken aback because there was, it was really high sugar. And I think that's what also kept me up in some of those. <laughs> I was just going to say that probably helped keep your energy up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I think towards the end of the season, I definitely got used to it. And to be honest, it just felt like another drink to me. Just, <laughs> oh, just let's drink some water, guys. <laughs> Then you had to go to the dentist after the shoot to make sure that your teeth were clean, right? Yeah. yeah a lot <laughs> you, know, of, yeah. <laughs> you and Damien have an amazing rapport on camera, and I would love to know what you've learned from him working with him as an actor. Working with Damien has just been amazing. He's an amazing person, an amazing actor. There's so much you can learn from him. He does all of his scenes so well, um, especially some of the serious stuff. I mean, just as you work with him more and more, you start to learn he's just an even more amazing actor you could really get in a scene with him really connect with him um very easily and i think that's another thing that helped with me and him we formed a bond and we took that into each scene and really made it a real father-daughter experience even offset oh very sweet you can tell that you like each other a lot <laughs> or you're just acting i can't tell you're both great actors you know you just never know well, congratulations, Madison. You are really spectacular. I cannot wait to see what else happens this season. It's pretty gangbusters pilot. So <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Of course. And Seath, amazing work as always. Um, if people don't know your name, they need to because you're one of the most prolific television directors. Your resume is probably like a dream roster of work. I mean, Homeland, The Wire, Grey's Anatomy, Walking Dead, and that is just a sliver of it. 
And to be able to glide so effortlessly among all these genres is just incredible. I don't know too many people who can do that. So congratulations. I was wondering when you were sitting down Thank to conceive, you're welcome. When you're conceiving the look and feel of a show like this, which is at once fantastical and dreamlike, but also again, as we've said, grounded in a real setting, it's not like Gotham or you know, sort of a made up place. What, what is your palette that you're hoping to work with? Cause you're doing a lot of night shoots and how are you making sure that it doesn't get too visually dark because the audience does need a reprieve from that a little bit, right? That is a great question. I mean, you know, I think the, um, and, and again, thank you for having all of us. We, we're just so excited about this project and, and, and what Demian said is so true. I mean, for us, it really is um, just an opportunity to be creative and to tell a story and for me, like arriving at the those answers is, is always a, a bit of a process and a journey. You know, I, I won't say I read something and, and just like see the images right away. It's, it's more of discovery and, and getting inside the piece. And, and this one in particular, I mean, in all honesty, when I read it, I was I didn't know Andrew yet. And um, this was a beloved film. And I was like, uh oh, how are they going to screw this one up? And I read it. Were you worried about that? Like having to reinvent. I, I wasn't even worried about it. It was more <laughs> like, how are they going to do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like it was almost a foregone conclusion. And then when I read it, I was just, I was blown away. I was affected by the story. You know what I mean? And I was connected to it in a, in a way that was, you know, I could appreciate the, the the storytelling and the artistry of Andrew's writing and, and the work, but I also connected to it on a personal level. So like, the discovery of like how to frame it so you're honest about the story and you know what is that palette is is really a journey in trying to figure out how to articulate on the screen everything that affected you so deeply when you read it you know what I mean and in terms of the grounded nature of it I think part of that for me was it it really did feel like a real story it didn't feel like some fantastic yarn about magical creatures. And I think that is because of exactly what Andrew was talking about. Um, this understanding of this experience of these creatures, these monsters, if you will, as, as fully realized, you know, souls that are going through something, you know what I mean? And then to understand that their plight is not their plight alone, but the, you know, people that love them, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers, whoever's connected to these characters, you know, try, so for me, it was always like the tone of it. And thankfully, this was one of those rare sort of uh, collaborations where from from the first conversation, Andrew and I were like finishing each other's sentences, you know what I mean? So it was, you know, really, I'd say a shared vision that, you know, because we want people to connect to these individuals as real human beings going through these journeys, it's about grounding the story. It's not about telling some fantastic thing. And yes, there are, are things that I think don't happen in real life, you know what I mean? But the more you ground it, the more believable everything else is. So that was just like our sort of baseline. And then in terms of the, 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 the sort of light and darkness and how much darkness is too bleak, you know, it's really just for me, a matter of trusting what is on the page. You know what I mean? I, I, I didn't really approach it from a standpoint of, oh, this scene is too dark and therefore we need to lighten it up. It's like, this is what happens. This is the reality of the world, that, of the story we're telling. This is the reality for our characters. So let's lean into telling it in the most grounded way. You know what I mean? And trust that where there is lightness, um, and also the other thing is, and this is something we always talk about, was the sort of light and darkness, like as dark as things are, and this is one of the things I loved about it, was like in all this darkness, in some of the things that characters are doing that are, and I'm being vague on purpose to not spoil <laughs> anything, but like everything is motivated by such love, by connection, by, you know, desire to, you know, no one's, no one's doing anything actually out of malice. So even in the dark places, there's, there is in a, in a way, a center of light, you know what I mean? And, and that was something we did try to articulate visually, you know what I mean? We talked about lightness and darkness. So we would look for ways to bring prop, pops of color into frame or, 
you know, literally lights and, and particularly our street exteriors and, and working with uh, Eric Bronco, who was our lead cinematographer, was such a dream, like, you know, capturing the sort of, you know, mixed light that you see in New York City is just one a way to articulate that visual thing, but also another way to ground the world. You know what I mean? We're not right. gonna go make all the color temperatures match and make it perfect because that's what people do in cinema. We're gonna lean into the reality of mixed mm -hmm. lighting because that on just a subconscious level, I think makes everything more real, makes the experience real for the characters and therefore real for our audience trying to connect to them, mm. if that makes sense. Absolutely, well, well said. And, and there's nothing more annoying than a night shoot where you know that they're, they're lighting a forest and you're thinking, but this is at night, why would there be so much light? <laughs> so I did appreciate how dark it is because it feels like when it's dark, it's dark. That's really what darkness is, right? <laughs> Amen. And thank you for that. You really have created an incredible world. Uh, I can't wait to see what happens next. And lastly, but of course not least, Anika. Amazing work as always. Uh, your thank resume you. is so varied, almost as varied as Demian, but he hasn't been in a lot of musicals that I know of. So I think you might have the edge <laughs> that we know of. There could be a Mexican production I'm not aware of. Um, but this is the first, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first time you've played a homicide detective on screen. Is this true? Sort of. Sort of, okay. Uh, I was in power and I was a homicide detective then, but I was also a murderer, so. Right, that's what I was wondering, <laughs> that you kind of had split loyalties in that part, so this Bit one of a is psychopath, your... <laughs> <Right>? yeah. <laughs> well, you're, as far as we know, you're, you're a good, you know, a good guy in this show, um, but also, you know, a single parent doing this really difficult job. I was wondering, what did you learn about what someone like Naomi goes through in having to balance single parenting, she's dealing with her ex and his struggles, but also having to do this really hard job during this crime scourge in New York. Did you do research and speak to real detectives? I, because I've played detectives before, I sort of had that information on me. Um, I am no stranger uh, to, I was a child of divorce, so I've watched mm. <laughs> and experienced the life of uh, single mothers who work. Um, I think that single mothers are, like there should be a kit that comes with a cape for them. Absolutely. Uh, because I, you know, the, the amount of work just to raise a human mm -hmm. and make sure that that human is happy as happy as possible, protected, feels safe, um, gets home to an environment that also feels safe, is able to get back and forth from one space to another when they're of the age that they can do that on their own. Um, the amount of work that goes into that, never mind making sure that person has food. Right. <laughs> right. You know, when they get home, somebody has to make something to eat, but you're working all day. Um, how do you put that together? Um, I, I think that is a phenomenal, admirable, amazing, awesome thing that people do. And listen, parents fail. Parents fail every day, whether they are single parents or in a multi-parent home, they fail because they're humans and they don't know how to do what they're doing because generally it's the first time they've done it. So they're doing the best that they can do. And I think that for Naomi, she's doing the best that she can do. And she, she fails immediately. <laughs> like she <laughs> and she's open about it too which is nice she's very open about it right she is and yeah. one thing that I really like about her is that she is very honest and she's very honest with her child and I think that that's a very very important thing because I don't you know children really don't miss much if mm -hmm. they don't actively see it they feel it mm -hmm. um because as much as we think we're hiding something from a kid or spelling it out so they don't know, you know, C-A-N-D-Y, like they know. <laughs> right. um, but also children know you better than anybody else. I think your children know you better than your spouse and potentially better than your parent because they're the only person who's known you in this space of your time for who you are in that, in that space. So, you know, I think parents try to hide stuff from kids all the time. Naomi's turning the, the TV off so that Isaiah doesn't know that people are being murdered in the city. But Isaiah goes to school and he's being treated awfully every day at school. He knows right. this city is crap. Um, fortunately, 
you know, he also has a magical light spirit. Now, is she doing a great job letting him hold on to his magical light spirit? <laughs> Not really, but she's trying right. to protect it because well, she's and there's a beautiful scene him. where she's telling him maybe don't dress in a way that could make him a target. And yes, I think so because... many parents now as children are finding their own identities, whether it's sexually, you know, their gender expression, no parent wants their child to leave the house and be a target, but they want them to be who they are. So Absolutely. that's a really interesting balance. And unfortunately, she knows the risk. She deals in this yeah. risk and the, and the dangers that face anyone who steps on the streets, you know, adult. Absolutely. Or, right? And of course, she, you know, she wants to go handcuff the kid that hurts him, but she can't, yeah. you know, right. I can't go as a cop and treat this child who's a terrorist the same way I would treat an adult. So that's also a really tough, tough thing to have to deal with you when you see your your person, your brand new person that you made come home and their spirit is crushed, but his right. isn't, which right. is amazing. He's an amazing character. <laughs> he's, he's an amazing he's, character and he's an amazing kid. He's yeah. really an amazing kid. And so all that light that you see come through him on that screen is inherently who he is. And it's a, he's a beautiful little person, not really little anymore to work <laughs> with. <laughs> But he's beautiful to work with and he is so easy and natural, but also um, a professional child. Like he works really hard at what he does, as does Madison. We were very, very blessed to have the both of them on, uh, on screen. Well, they, you know, they say to never work with kids, but if you have to, these kids seem like, you know. These are the ones. Choice. <laughs> these are the ones. As long as we don't throw are a pet the in the game, exactly. we, we might be okay. <laughs> Madison, you're so poised and mature. I think you've ruined everyone for working with children again because I don't think you're the you're the typical kid. <laughs> this is what I'm picking up about. Yeah, you. I, I don't I don't even know anymore. <laughs> you don't even know. So I have a question from the festival sponsor City, and it's for Andrew and Seath. And City would like to know what is it about the vampire genre that you think has endured for now more than a century? I mean, the earliest book novel centering on Dracula this was the late 1800s and here we are 2022 still loving these stories what is it about vampires specifically that separates them from other so-called monster genres maybe see if I can hear your take on it first oh I, for, I was really hoping you'd go to Andrew <laughs> I, don't have I had him first Andrew, last time I, I do have, you know it's it's a great question and, and I, I don't know but you know one thing that I was thinking was um, and it's funny, again, the sort of treatment of late where vampires, you know, we sort of embrace what's hip and cool about vampires. But, you know, I think that I think what's interesting about vampires is, you know, a, a lot of storytelling. Uh, I think people are interested in um, characters that can be very pure. Right. They, they are not bound by you know, they need to keep their job. Um, they, you know what I mean? I think it's the same way that, you know, people are into stories about outlaws and criminals, you know, that there's, there's, a, there's a certain kind of, um, how shall I say, emotional honesty or purity to how they govern themselves through life, right? And mm. so the notion of not being checked by mortality in the same way that most of our, us are, well, all of us are. What am I talking about? Um, is, <laughs> is there something we don't know about you, see? <laughs> <laughs> Most of you mortals. Um, I, I think there's. I think there's something that's that's fascinating about that. You know what I mean? Um, it's also vampires aren't to blame for who they are, right? That someone did this to them. They weren't born bad. I guess, for lack of a better term, they're sort of whether it's you know, we're using the allegory of addiction or they grew up in an abusive household or something. I think we sort of feel bad for vampires. What did they do to deserve this life, right? Or I guess perpetual living. <laughs> I think there's something that's incredibly intimate about mm. the vampire. You know, it, 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 it bites your neck. And in most, in most horror stories, we're running from the monster. But mm. with vampire, you actually have to bend your neck. You have to let them in. And, right. and I think there's something that there's an acknowledgement there that, um, you know, we are, when we let people in, we are risking something terrifying. We're risking something dangerous. And, you know, as storytellers, it's incredibly exciting because I, um, 
you, you know, when you start out in your writing, you're taught right toward conflict, you know, have people fight. And what you come to realize is that compassion and connection can be more compelling than conflict. You can be more drawn in when people are, there's more danger and there's more tension than when, when people are pulling together than when, when, when they're fighting. And I think there's just something inherently intimate about, um, about vampires that, that um, makes them both alluring and, and, and terrifying. And certainly it's a, it's a good word for our show as we try to write toward both of those things pull toward the terror and intimacy. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I've been obsessed with vampires ever since reading Dracula. And I think part <laughs> of it is, is that, is that intimacy. Hmm. That's so interesting. And that's a perfect segue to my final question, which is the series premieres in October. So that's my favorite season of Halloween. I don't know about you, but can't get enough of October. What was the first scary movie story or book that you read or watched that whet your appetite for these kind of stories? And I'm gonna start with Demian because I know Mexicans love their dark stories, El Dia de los Muertos, etc. <laughs> <laughs> El Dia de los Muertos is very well said. In my culture, we dance with the death. We, we have made peace with it even before we are born. Uh, it is part of our story and history, you know, uh, and uh, to me, there's no life without death, you know, and uh, so yes, we grew up watching those films, but they were always very uh, fantastic in the sense of fantasy, uh, you know, wrestlers uh, <laughs> fighting mummies and uh, and vampires and the uh, women vampires and the uh, so those those were my horror films, La, the films are on San El Santo, the um, Silver Mass wrestler, uh, but they were always a lot of fun. I think the first film that scared me was The Exorcist. Oh yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> it might slip away. <laughs> and Madison, how about you? I know you haven't been alive as long as the rest of us, but is there something that you loved as a kid that? where you felt like, oh, I like being scared. You kind of love the thrill of it. You know, I've, I've never really been much of a horror movie fan um, until now. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was always scared to watch all those scary movies, um, horror movies. But, you know, after I filmed, after I worked on Let the Right One In, I realized it's not so bad because it's all fake. And now, <laughs> I mean, this this show changed my whole thinking on horror movies because now whenever I see something really bloody and gory, my immediate thought is just, oh, that was a long day. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, or you think that's a lot of crystal light that person had to ingest? Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of mouth blood. Ew, you know, I mean, I think the show really changed my thought on horror movies. So I haven't really watched any horror movies in my life but I think okay. now definitely I'm going to start watching a lot well when when your parents say it's okay the exorcist is a really good first stop on that <laughs> it might be your last stop <laughs> <laughs> and how about you and Nika did you have any favorites as a kid did you say books or films or just any story that you read like personally I was obsessed with Stephen King as a kid I read Misery like 10 times I read I mean I don't know why I was like in fifth grade reading these books but they were really the there's something so thrilling about immersing oneself in a scary story that made maybe it's because it helps us cope with real life better I'm not sure I'm still processing this but hmm, I don't know or read or I would rather read a book than watch a horror film frankly I'd rather read than watch anything to be perfectly honest <laughs> but I <laughs> so as a kid I read everything um I love Stephen King I Anne Rice was mm. whew, yes. um, magnificent to Speaking me of vampires, um, right. <clears throat> it is oh. a book that I read in Amazing. probably three days and it worked me like I could not I remember walking down the street and the sewer I was like well maybe not maybe not there maybe I, it's maybe so I'll terrifying over here. Yeah. <laughs> awful um, but fantastic and the skeleton crew was also an amazing book even though those were just vignettes and small stories he was a master masterful writer because the way that he described things you really felt that you were in that space with him and it mm. felt very personal um what you were reading Carrie is probably one of the best horror films to be made. Amazing. 
in the film that took me out because I saw it at seven and I'm still angry with my cousin <laughs> is Jaws. <laughs> Jaws took me, took me. I love the ocean. My people are from Cape Cod. I was always in the water. Um, pools were difficult after Jaws. Like yeah. a shadow <laughs> in the pool are. was a quick stroke to the edge. Like, I was like, oh, time to get out. It, it was too much. So. <laughs> yeah. so maybe Madison, maybe we'll, you know, put off this stuff until later. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll start making a list. You know? <laughs> Anyone else? I don't want to cut off Andrew or Seath if you have any any favorites. I just when I was a little kid, I I don't know if you remember those series of books called Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Oh, yeah. I worked mm -hmm. on those. And then I was just a little bit younger than Madison when I um snuck out, lied to my parents, and went and saw Candyman. And then I just well, ah! it for a month. Rough. For a month. <laughs> so that was uh you might want to just wait a little bit, Madison, before. <laughs> The Exorcist, but uh, you know, now that I'm talking about it, I'm thinking this is a lot of trauma we've all endured <laughs> from these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that little clown under the bed and poltergeist. Oh. Thank oh, you. Wow. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I, for me, it was um, there were there were three films that I saw that really shook me up, and and some of them I haven't actually gone back to see. I can't even say I was a lover of horror as a kid because I was. I was mortified by some of these movies. And, and, and then when I started becoming a filmmaker, you know, I dug back into them and, you know, with a little age and maybe a little more courage, I could, I could, <laughs> I could endure them. But the, the three that like, you know, affected me slash maybe scarred me were The Exorcist, um, Salem's Lot mm -hmm. and Children of the Corn. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other thing that, I feel like I should throw in there that really had an effect on me because for a long time I was like, I'm scared of all supernatural things. And then I read something by Stephen King that I'm not even sure qualifies as a horror story in, in the traditional Stephen King way, but it was The Apt Pupil, oh, which yeah. oh, mm -hmm. yeah. great movie too. Yeah. terrified me in, in a way that was beyond, like it actually made me less scared of supernatural stories <laughs> because it was like, this could really happen. You know what I mean? Like this, you know, and, and, and so, yeah, those, those are, those are four that I would hold up as my sort of formative horror experiences that made, you know, a real lasting impression on me. I still haven't gone back to watch Salem's Lot um, in its entirety. <laughs> I got to get over that, I guess. Maybe, maybe for season two, I'll, I'll finally find the courage. <laughs> well, know, we obviously have to thank Stephen King for so many nightmares, but so many wonderful stories. <laughs> Seems like he's informed a lot of our preferences on this front. But I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, I'm so excited to see what happens with the rest of the series. It's such an incredible first episode. I think fans of this genre are going to love it. But also, I think it's a show that people who may not think they like, quote unquote, vampire stories will be very drawn in. So congratulations. And I just want to say a thank you to everyone for joining us today and the wonderful cast and creative team of Showtime's Let the Right One In. Most importantly, the series premieres on streaming Friday, October 7th and on air is Sunday, October 9th at 10 p.m. on Showtime. Thank you to City for their support, and you can enjoy more of these programs by clicking the subscribe button below. Thank you so much, and take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Stacey. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you guys.